So now a grunt of this talk is gonna be about ischemia. So whenever we talk about ischemia, there's two things that could be happening. You could have a plaque rupture or erosion that's causing a complete occlusion of your coronary artery, which is what we see here. And that would lead to STEMI or ST elevations, or you can have a partial occlusion or partial um, erosion that's causing obstruction, which usually causes end STEMIs or unstable angina. The reason obviously that this causes chest pain is because you have complete occlusion of blood flow, you're not supplying the myocardium with nutrition, you're having pain. The reason this would cause the partial occlusion causes chest pain is you just have, don't have enough blood flow, right? You have this kind of stenosis, you have this blockage and not enough blood is going through that artery to supply the myocardium with enough nutrients um, to have it function appropriately. So then you start getting ischemia and then you start having chest pain. One thing to note is we always classically think that this is the only thing that causes STEMIs. That's not true. And we'll see a case later that even partial occlusions like this um, can present as STEMIs as well. So that is ischemia. Whenever you have a patient with ischemia, it's important to kind of note some of the symptoms that they have. So chest pain is obviously the one that we always think about. Chest pain, chest pain, chest pain. The good old Levine syndrome, substernal chest pain, radiating down the arm into the neck. That is great if you see it, but most patients will not present that way. They will present with nonspecific chest pain, dullness, achiness, or just not feeling right. But from your guys' standpoint, the most important thing to know is that these other symptoms are very common for ischemia as well. So patients presenting with shortness of breath, patients having palpitations, altered mental status, syncope, weakness. We actually had a STEMI a couple months ago where the patient presented just altered and they had a massive RCA STEMI. So it's important to not forget about ischemia whenever you're seeing patients with altered mental status or these other symptoms, because that's something reversible that we can fix. And that's, some, that's one of the ways that we can also save their life. So now let's jump into STEMIs and EKG findings. So whenever we have ischemia on an EKG, there's five different things that you can see. You can see one, peak T waves, two, T wave inversions, three, SD depressions, uh, four, ST elevations, and then five, Q waves. This little diagram here is super helpful because it kind of tells us the evolution of um, and a STEMI on an EKG. It's from a, one of the emergency medicine journals. And it kind of shows that the first change that we see with ischemia is hyperacute T waves. So we rarely see this because it presents within minutes to hours of the ischemia. It's mainly minutes. And by the time we show up, whether it's from an EMS standpoint or when they come to the ED, it's usually been at least an hour or they've been having for several hours or several days. So we rarely see the pure acute T wave um, peaking. Usually what we see is then what forms a little bit after that are the ST elevations. So we have the ST elevations that we're all aware about, but what's important to note is that Q waves, which we normally kind of think about as old ischemia and old infarct, actually start developing within one hour of infarction. So it's not uncommon for you to present to a patient's play, uh, house and then you see that they've been having chest pain for three hours and they have already a Q wave. And that's very, very common. Um, and we've seen it also from our standpoint because patients that have had chest pain for a while and they come in with very deep Q waves, from our standpoint, it actually might not be as beneficial to intervene and open up that artery because we know that that tissue is actually already dead and ischemic. So after we have ST elevations, after we have some Q waves forming, then we start getting some T wave inversions after a few days. Um, and then after a few weeks to months, we finally get recovery of the EKG with these Q waves. So that's kind of the evolution of a STEMI um, on an EKG and some of the kind of findings that we would see. So now let's talk about STEMIs. So let's talk about our first case here. So we have a 65 year old retired firefighter who presented with several hours of dull substernal chest pain. He was telling me that about four hours into his, or four miles into his 27 mile bike ride that he does about three to four times a week he started having this chest pain. He's like, ah, just very nonspecific, kind of substernal, didn't really radiate anywhere. He has this history of GERD, um, and he said it didn't really feel like that, but it wasn't that just um, uncomfortable, so he kept on riding. He finishes the ride, comes home, tells his wife about it, and his wife freaks out and calls EMS right away. His heart rate was okay, it was 78 beats per minute. His blood pressure was also fine, 121 over 80, and then we get this EKG. 
So I'll let you guys look at this EKG for a few seconds. And then we'll go to the question. So do you activate a code STEMI? Yes, no, maybe. Type your answers in into the chat box. And I'll pull up the EKG again. Great. All yeses. All yeses. I love it. I love it. So let's look at the EKG and the ED, right? So using our systematic, systematic method, right? We're looking at rate. It looks, for the most part, a normal rate, not super bradycardic, not tachycardic. Rhythm looks like normal sinus rhythm. And then looking at ischemia, top to bottom, left to right. Looking at one, no ischemic changes there. Looking at two, maybe some kind of changes here, but not enough to meet our criteria. Three looks okay, maybe some T wave flattening, T wave inversions. Looking at ADR, we see some T, uh, T wave inversions, but we'll talk about this. This is actually normal to see those in ADR. ADL looks okay with some T wave flattening, ADF, normal. And then moving to the precordial leads, we start seeing some ST elevations here in V1, V2, definitely some ST elevations here, V3, definitely some ST elevations there, V4, less so, V5, not as much, V6. So, in the ED, we saw this EKG, and yes, we're concerned for a STEMI, but the history just doesn't make sense, right? This guy biked 27 miles, and he started having chest pain within four hours of his bike ride. This could be maybe some kind of repolarization abnormality. He's a very fit guy. Could that be due to it? So we didn't take him straight to the cath lab. First, we took an ultrasound, put a probe on him, and we actually saw that his whole anterior wall was down. So that got us super concerned, and we took him straight to the cath lab. So here's some images from our cath lab. Um, you don't have to know our cath lab anatomy and how to look at angiograms to appreciate what we're seeing here. So as you can see, this whole artery is gone. And that's the left anterior descending, the LAD. So we cathed him, shot some dye, and we saw that the whole LAD was occluded at this proximal portion. We pushed a wire through it, placed a stent, and then opened it wide up. So it was amazing because had this, had this person not had this kind of baseline exercise tolerance and he wasn't as fit, uh, STEMI like this would have killed him. No doubt, no doubt, because his infarct would have just taken out that whole anterior wall, if not more. And if he, had, he hadn't had the healthy myocardial tissue beforehand, he probably would have DF'd and died. So it just kind of goes to show that even though a person looks healthy and they're having this non-specific chest pain, doesn't mean that something really, really bad isn't going on in their coronary arteries, because we were all shocked when we cast this guy um, and saw that his whole LED was down because his symptoms and his story did not really go with our classic uh, STEMI presentation. So what's the definition of a STEMI? So this is from the ACC guidelines, the American College of Cardiology. And what they define as a STEMI is a J point elevation in two contiguous leads with a cutoff point of one millimeter, so that's one little box in any leads, or two millimeters in V2 and V3. There are specific criteria for men above 40, men less than 40, and for women, but I think the key thing to remember is one little box and then two little boxes in V2, V3. We'll talk about contiguous leads in a few slides from now, but it's really important to know that that one millimeter elevation can sometimes be subtle, but that's the definition of a STEMI. So what is the J point? The J point is indicated here with two, and what, it in, and what it represents is the connection between the QRS complex and the T wave. So it's this little segment right here. So whenever we talk about J point elevation or ST elevations, we're comparing this to the baseline of the EKG. And whenever I'm like questioning whether this is a true ST elevation or whether it meets one box, what I do is I take this PR segment here and I draw a line to the next PR segment. And that gives me a baseline, right? Because then you could clearly see that the baseline's here, you have one box, two box, and that J point is clearly two boxes or two millimeters above that, um, that baseline segment. In the field, obviously you're gonna have patients that are trembling, you have artifact, the EKG is kind of going up and down, up and down. So I think it's good to just kind of get in the habit to take a pen, pencil, whatever, just scratch a line from one PR segment to the other, because that could really help you differentiate whether there's a true ST elevation or not. 
And the reason for that is it's important because some patients actually at baseline have SP elevations. Um, so it's good to know kind of what that distance is on their prior EKG so that when we see a new one, we can compare it. 